Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second season of the online colloquium Pluralizing the Anthropocene, Re-envisioning the Future of the Planet in the 21st Century. My name is Gonzalo Santos. I'm a social cultural anthropologist in the Research Center for Anthropology and Health and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. I'm also the director of SciTech Asia, an international um, research network with strong interests in the environmental humanities. In addition to being the curator of, uh, of uh, this colloquium, I will be the moderator of tonight's uh, season with multidisciplinary scholar Maya Kovskaya, whose work on performative and visual cultures dwells on the intersection between the political, the cultural and the ecological while engaging with the concept of the Anthropocene. Good evening, Maya. I know it's already quite late in Thailand, so many thanks for joining us and making the time. Welcome to Pluralizing the Anthropocene. So before moving on to a proper introduction of Maya's distinguished and I would say transgressive trajectory as a scholar, I would like to say a few words about the background of this colloquium, especially for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Let me start with a few acknowledgements. Uh, pluralizing the Anthropocene builds on a creative partnership between several institutions representing the sciences, the arts and the humanities. The Research Center for Anthropology and Health, the Fundación de Serralve, the International Research Network SciTech Asia, the Center for Functional Ecology, Science for People and the Planet, and the Department of Life Sciences at the University of Coimbra. I would like to thank these institutions for their encouragement and for making this colloquium possible. Many thanks also to the members of the Sahovs technical team for their support. Sahovs is a leading cultural uh, institution that is well known for its role in promoting public debates on topics that matter to everyone. And there is hardly a topic that matters to everyone more than the increasing environmental and climate uncertainties of the present era. The publication last August of a report written by experts from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change made newspaper headlines all over the world due to a series of alarming predictions for 2030 that paint a picture of growing environmental and climate disruptions in different parts of the world, including Portugal. This 3000 page report makes it quite clear that while the effects of these disruptions differ from place to place, from social group to social group. What is causing these disruptions are systemic factors that are global in scope and that need to be addressed in the short term to reverse the trend of ruination and avoid compromising the livability of the planet. When I first started talking about this colloquium with colleagues at the University of Coimbra, I wanted to create an open, multivocal, an international forum of debate that brought together scholars from different parts of the world and from many different fields across the sciences, the humanities and the arts. But I wanted to create a forum of debate that remained connected to the larger public. So I invited scholars to explain their vision of what got us into this mess and what and how to get out of it in a language free of technical jargon. The present decade, the third of the 21st century, will be decisive when it comes to addressing the current environmental crisis before we plunge into a conjuncture of chaos even more disturbing than what we are already experiencing in the present. I know there are many people out there denying the relevance and urgency of these concerns, but even these people cannot really ignore ongoing debates on environmental destruction, climate change and the future of human life on the planet. These are the biggest challenges of the epoch we live in, the Anthropocene or the age of humans. The term Anthropocene was coined by the late atmospheric scientist Paul Crutzen in a conference sometime in 2000 to highlight the role of human activities in climate change. The term was then appropriated by geologists to refer to the present geological era as a period in which humans have become one of the most potent geophysical forces in the planet and their activities leading to increasing environmental uncertainties. We are now in 2021 and Paul Crutzen died earlier this year and there is still no consensus within the geophysical sciences on the validity of the term Anthropocene 
just as there is no consensus on the precise beginning of the Anthropocene as a geological era. But most scholars would agree, would agree with Crutzen, with Paul Crutzen, that the environmental impact of the human planetary expansion has become increasingly visible after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In the last two decades, the term Anthropocene has gained increasing popularity beyond the geophysical sciences, entering the humanities, the social sciences, the arts, and the media, and leading to the development of critical alternative terms. The list is very long. They include Capitalocene and many other, all of which defined in relation to the original concept of the Anthropocene. Whichever way we look at this concept, the Anthropocene has entered global cultural and political imaginaries as some kind of hyper object or magnet that helps capture the tensions and the dilemmas of the age we live in. An age that is marked by increasing anxieties about the future of human life on the planet. But the Anthropocene is not just about the runaway world of environmental doom. It is also about overcoming disaster and catastrophe and creating new visions of hope and justice. The colloquium pluralizing the Anthropocene is, a, is an attempt to develop a more inclusive and diverse understanding of the challenges ahead. Using the term Anthropocene to refer to the current age of increasing anthropogenic environmental uncertainties has certainly started new conversations about what needs to be changed in the global economic system. But it has also generated a monolithic understanding of the Anthropocene as a unified human experience. And we are certainly going to hear a lot about this today. The framing of the Anthropocene around the universalizing species paradigm has a homogenizing effect that hides significant exclusions and inequalities. Not all humans are equally implicated in the major forces driving contemporary human environmental crises, and not all humans and hardly any non-humans are invited into the conceptual spaces where these disasters are theorized or responses to disaster formulated. If we really want to do something to create a global economic system that is truly sustainable in the long run, we need to be capable of developing a more inclusive conversation and we need to be capable of building a global economy that is no longer focused on conquering nature, but on learning how to coexist with the plurality of life forms around us. The second season of Pluralizing the Anthropocene will feature scholars in the humanities and social sciences whose work is strongly committed to a diverse and inclusive and diverse understanding of the challenges of the Anthropocene. Every talk will be followed by an informal conversation and Q&A session with the audience via the chat function. The chat function is currently closed, but it will be open towards the end of the talk. If you would like to ask a question, please prepare your question and have it ready to be posted in the chat box once the Q&A session starts. This talk will be conducted in English. If you need language assistance, Microsoft Teams has a live transcript function that can be activated by pressing the live transcript symbol that it should be located in the right bottom corner of the application. Please bear in mind that this event is being recorded by Sarovs and will be later released for public viewing via the internet. If you missed the first season of this colloquium, you can watch it on the YouTube channel of Sarov. But let me go back to the main reason why we are all here. In the opening conference of this colloquium, the great French anthropologist Philippe Tescola showed what went wrong in the human planetary expansion and what kind of cosmopolitical responses might be formulated to put an end to the current course of destruction and to protect the interests of the most vulnerable. In the second conference of this colloquium, Indian environmental historian Rowan de Souza took us on a wonderful journey to the field of environmental history in South Asia and other parts of the world, approaching the conceptual challenges of the Anthropocene from the perspective of environmental historians. Today, Multidisciplinary scholar of performative and visual cultural studies, Mayakovskaya, will propose a critical approach to the Anthropocene as an aesthetic paradigm, what she calls the Anthroposupremocene. It's a great honor to have Maya with us. Maya obtained their, her, their PhD in political science from UC Berkeley in 2009, 
pursuing a highly international intellectual trajectory, straddling many different disciplines and areas of interest in the environmental humanities. Maya has, has 20 years of experience living and doing research in China and nearly a decade in India. Currently based in Thailand at Chiang Mai University, Maya teaches multi-species and Anthropocene studies, post-humanist STS, eco-philosophical, political, cultural, visual, cultural theory and semiotics. They have authored, co-authored, edited, translated and contributed to numerous books and articles on the intersection between the political and ecological with contemporary art, performative and visual culture and the Anthropocene concept. Mai is the founder of the Amur Mundi Multi-Species Ecological World Making Lab, an international multidisciplinary research initiative in the Global South, investigating how human and more than human world making and survival are mutually entangled. A substantial part of Maya's recent theoretical work is collaborative and has focused on rethinking the human in a more than human world. Maya has curated many workshops, symposia, saloons, exhibitions, multidisciplinary field meetings, bringing together philosophers, artists, scientists, writers, humanities and social science scholars, legal scholars and activists to build new knowledges and practices to confront the unfolding ecological catastrophe. Maya, I'm truly delighted to have you here with us. Many thanks once again. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayakovskaya against the aesthetic paradigm of the Anthropo Supremo scene. Maya, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Gonzalo, and huge thanks for inviting me to join my voice into this amazing conversation across disciplines, geographic boundaries, about the plural heterogeneous and patchy conditions that we sometimes call the Anthropocene. It's an enormous honor for me to be amongst such August company, and I've already learned so much from the previous talks in season one, uh, including Tim Ingold, Augustine Fuentes, and Anand Singh, and many more. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the talks in season two. This is a conversation that is nowhere near over. So without further ado, this is going to be a kind of a two part talk that draws on the sort of two different hats that I wear. Um, I'm trained as a political philosopher as well as a linguistic um, and cultural anthropologist. And, uh, but my work for about 15 years was as an art curator, which brought me closer and closer to working on ecological questions until eventually the ecological became the center of my investigations and my work came full circle back to political theory and to political theory questions and modes of inquiry, but bringing them together with both visual and conceptual cultural questions. So today this talk has a conceptual component that I connect with aesthetics, but not in a way that you're expecting. And also uh, after I lay out some of the conceptual ground, we will move and look at some artworks of artists who are doing work to engage in what I call ecological remediations of the Anthropocene condition. Art against the Anthropocene, as the brilliant TJ Demos uh, calls it in the book by the same name. So I want to start, I'm not going to read the whole poem, but you, some of you may be familiar with this poem, Kindness by Naomi Shihab Nye, the Palestinian poet. And there's a few lines in here that I want to just highlight. She talks about how we learn kindness or empathy through loss. And, you know, when we're so in pain from our own personal losses, that it's important to look out and see the pain and loss of others and realize that they could be you, that their loss is similar to your loss. And she says, before you can learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road, you must see how this could be you, how he was too with someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread of all sorrows. And you see the size of the cloth then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. 
Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out into the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from the crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. It is in this spirit that I offer my talk. I would like to offer a few threads that connect with some of the previous and future talks. These threads, I want to preface by saying, are nowhere near complete, definitive statement um, on the Anthropocene by any stretch, but are offered instead in the hopes that they may be joined by other threads offered by other scholars and speakers and audience members so that over the course of these dialogues and the dialogues that I hope these conversations set in motion among all of you out in the audience with your friends, whether you are scholars, whether you are activists, whether you're just ordinary people who care about the world, these are conversations we all need to be having and learning the importance of kindness and connecting our sorrows to the sorrows and pain of the world is critically important. So she talks about the size of the cloth. So in the threads that I'm trying to bring out and, and, and follow for you, I want to connect them to a larger cloth. African-American feminist theorist Bell Hooks in her essay, Liber Theory as Liberatory Practice, advocated theorizing from a place of pain, grounding theory in lived experience that was inclusion, inclusionary, not exclusionary, the way that it often is in academia. Facing the sixth mass extinction, biospheric destruction, climate catastrophe, the destabilization of the planet's life support systems, and the exacerbation of existing monstrous inequality, environmental racism, and politics of hate and exclusion, it is hard not to theorize now from a place of pain. There's so much of it, and the cloth is so huge. Hooks reminds us that when we can see our, pla our place, or when we can place, excuse me, our pain in a larger systemic context, then we can begin to see the size of the cloth of that shared pain. That cloth is the interweaving of all the pain. It is the intersection, multiple and myriad forms of pain and the place where empathy and solidarity and collective action can begin. So this talk seeks to highlight a few important threads in that enormous cloth of the pain of this planet in the throes of something unprecedented that we've never actually experienced in the entire history of humanity. And it, I believe that the threads form the pattern in the weft and warp, and that only when we can see how I diverse pains interconnect into larger patterns, can we find the threads that must be yanked out to unravel the whole damn pattern? And so it is in that spirit that I begin. With this in mind, uh, I wanna give my land acknowledgement and uh, apologies if it looks like I'm not looking at you. I'm, I'm working off of two computer screens, one that you can see and one that I can see. So um, I'm, I'm just a caveat there. So my land acknowledgement begins um, with the idea that the biosphere belongs to all beings, not just human beings, and that the tiny population of living indigenous people have managed to preserve the vast majority of bi biodiversity left on this planet. And the rest of us need to learn from them and let indigenous people lead the way forward in practical ecological remediations. And I follow um, Tuck and Young in their brilliant essay, Decolonization is not a metaphor. Acknowledgements are not enough. We cannot reckon with the conditions of anthropogenic and capitalogenic ecological crisis described as the Anthropocene or Capitalocene or Plantationocene without reckoning with the entanglement of genocide and ecocide, anthroposupremacism and white supremacism, neoliberal global capitalism, slow violence and systemic racism. In other words, reparations are needed. Intersectional justice is needed. Traditional indigenous relational ontologies of coexistence and care offer an unparalleled model of reparation and remediation for the anthropo-supremacist, necropolitical, extractive, exploitative, capitalist violence destroying the life support systems of the planet and driving myriad species to extinction, returning the stolen lands to their traditional indigenous custodians, 
is not just an altruistic do-gooder gesture. It's actually a necessary first step towards undoing the necropolitical violence of the anthropo-supremacine. Now to reckon with and remediate this tapestry of planetary scale pain being called the Anthropocene condition, we need forms of intersectionality that include the more than human or other than human multi-species ecological worlds that certain forms of human life are breaking. We need to identify specifically, okay, practically, what Anthropos, right, in the Anthropocene concept entails and how he, and yes, I gender this with intent, how he instantiates the world-breaking stance with its implicit claims to dominion over the web of life. We need to unsettle, to use Sylvia Winter's term, which of course is a play also on settler colonialism, right? We need to unsettle and undo Anthropos to survive what's coming. Intersectionality against the Anthropocene, or what I call the Anthropo-Supremacy, must be a multi-species intersectionality. We must see how the cloth of human pain is woven into patterns that entwine with the pain of more than human worlds as well. Patterns that find their logical underpinnings in Anthropo-Supremacist negations that falsely imagine a version of humanity or society that is sundered from nature, whilst paradoxically, paradoxically is important here, paradoxically categorizing most of actual humanity as part of nature through dehumanizing moves that turn on the logics of the aesthetic paradigm of anthropo-supremacism. This talk will engage some of these ideas. And there is actually a, a rich body of literature about all of these questions. We can talk about it in the Q&A. Um, there are so many names that I would like to mention to you, uh, ranging from, from Val Plumwood to Jason Moore uh, and, and to numerous uh, critical race theorists and, and in indigenous scholars. And it would be wonderful in the Q&A if we could talk about paths forward and people we should be reading and talking to and engaging with intellectually. Um, so the Anthropo-Supremacine I call it an aesthetic paradigm and you're like, well, so what do you mean? Because we normally think of aesthetics as related to beauty, right? Well, I'm going to offer you a sort of different understanding of aesthetics that's rooted in both philosophy, but also in the, the study of um, performativity. And aesthetic paradigms constitute power. And they normatively encode the order of things that they frame. They encode things as being right, necessary, even admirable or desirable with enormous political consequences. So the Anthropo-Supremacine entails an aesthetic paradigm of human supremacy that for many is still sacrosanct for reasons that defy facts, scientific research findings, and which hinge on claims that man is the only being that, and you can pick your human exceptionalism, man is the only being that has culture, or man is the only being that has, and they always say man, right, that has language, man is the only being that has altruism or empathy, and, and so on. And in fact, down the line, these have been solidly debunked in all across a variety of disciplines, from the sciences to philosophy. All species are exceptional. So, Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, White Supremacy Scene, all of these terms, and there are many more that are alternates, can be understood as faces of a necropolitical excrescence. And by necropolitical, I'm referring to Achille Mbembe's idea of a politics of power that is essentially a death drive that, uh, that revolves around the, the power to take life and to destroy life. And this necropolitical excrescence emerges from an underlying political aesthetic paradigm, which I call the Anthropo-Supremacine, which subtends and enfolds them, okay? So described by Rancière and elaborated by the visual cultural theorist, Nicholas Mirzoff, 
The aesthetic is not merely a classificatory scheme of the beautiful, but rather there, there is an aesthetic dimension at the core of politics as the system of forms determining what presents itself to sense experience. Thus, through this aesthetic dimension, entities and experiences are framed and rendered sensible, right? We can sense them and they make sense, comprehensible, visualizable, recognizable, imaginable, legible, and so on, through a series of hidden, invisibilized criteria for judgment, performative constitutive criteria implicit to the framing. Most crucially, the aesthetic dimension wields a legitimizing force, making that which is aestheticized not merely appear to the senses, but more importantly, to seem right. Thus, aesthetics are the site of naturalization and the normalization of the formal orders of things that they embody. The aesthetics is the dimension that makes things see, the, the way things seem, seem to be right, seem to be the right order of things. You know, when you go, well, that's just the way it is, and this is how it should be. Thus, aesthetics are the site of naturalization and normalization of the formal orders they embody. And they perform the function of naturalizing and normalizing those orders. Complexes of visuality is one way to think about them. The aesthetic is part of what visual cultural theorist Nick Mirzoff calls complexes of visuality, which entail ways of seeing, ways of knowing, and thus play a role in ordering the world via three interlocking moves, categorization, separation, and aestheticization, right? First we name them, then we divide them, and then we make it seem as if the new order of things is right, is legitimate, is good. The geostratigraphic term, Anthropocene, that comes from geologists and a lot of scientists, was originally intended as an apolitical, scientific, and neutral reference to humanity's unprecedented recent effect on the planet. But the term has been widely criticized for presenting a homogenous and undifferentiated, universalized humanity in which Anthropos, in the Anthropocene, is treated as a collective actor an agent of the deleterious conditions that are actually created by particular specific types of human activity, modes of human activity, such as colonialism, capitalism. So some of these other names like capitalocene, plantationocene, white supremacy scene, they identify causal forces driving the emergence of this destabilized condition. And against the presumption of descriptive neutrality in the term Anthropocene as it was originally conceived, I offer my term Anthropocene not as an alternative to these terms per se, but rather as an underpinning because of how Anthropocene subtends and enfolds these conditions, supports them, right? and encompasses them. And the orders, the orders of things, the way things are ordered and organized in our world that have produced them. So Anthroposupremacy describes, and this is gonna be a lot of big words and I'll try to break it down for you, but the underlying ontologically constitutive species naming abjection of the animal from the human. Let me stop there before I read the whole sentence. So. Basically, the ontology of the species, okay, that Anthropos is claiming to represent, i.e., what kind of human Anthropos says we are, or Anthropos presents us to be, makes a specious, seemingly true, but actually false, universal claim to embody the human, which is why the geologists were like, you know, humanity is causing the destruction of the planet. Hence the Anthropocene. It also represents a toxic, historically specific, okay, it's not universal, it's not a historical, aesthetic paradigm, an ideological mode of being human, what 
the Cuban born Jamaican uh, raised brilliant philosopher and, and critic and theorist Sylvia Winter characterized as the overrepresentation of man or the genre of a human which claimed universal supremacist value for itself, for Anthropos, for man, capital M, at the expense of most humans and non-humans alike. So Anthropos supremacine as a concept describes this ontologically constitutive species naming. Okay, and here's the, another big concept that many of you probably know, but not everyone does. Abjection of the animal from the human. So when you think of something in an abject condition, right? They're pitiful, they're pathetic, they're degraded. And, and when abjection becomes a process, it's a kind of expulsion, an exclusion, right? An expulsion of the animal part of being human. I mean, humans are animals, right? But the animal part of our being is abjected away. It's not just divided neutrally. So remember, uh, categorize or name, separate and divide, and then aestheticize, right? So naming the human as man, as anthropos, as this historically specific being, involves abjecting that animal part of us and, and throwing it away as something dis insulting, disgusting, base, that we want to rise above and uh, that, that we have somehow evolved away from. Defining the human against the animal has become the, the biggest trope in Western civilization, I would come to say. So Anthropos comes into being as a historically specific entity through a specious false universal claim to embody the human. And instead, actually, Anthropos is a toxic, historically specific paradigm that aestheticizes that mode of being human. It is an ideology, okay? So when Sylvia Winter talked about this genre of the human as man, or the overrepresentation of man, um, this, she was writing this before the Anthrop Anthropocene debates came out, but later her work has come to be extremely relevant. In part, uh, it was because um, rich upper-class white European colonizers committing genocide and enslaving other peoples were anything but universal representatives, representatives of humanity, which was precisely what they claimed to be. Indeed, that power, the constitutive power, right, of this aesthetic paradigm is in part derived from these claims to their so-called universal supremacist value that are at the expense of actually most humans and non-humans alike. Description functioning as prescription, as Pierre Bourdieu would say. You call that thing into being by naming it and claiming it and stating it as if it were in fact simply the truth. What are alternative facts but a mode of this? So the aestheticized claims of the figure of Anthropos as standing above nature and being invidiously superior to the natural world and everyone and everything that is categorized as part of it are fundamental to the establishment of the dualisms that animated colonialism and capitalism. And there are, again, some wonderful things we can, you can read about dualisms. We can talk about in the, in the conversation after the talk, if you want. Um, I, there are many great people who've written about this. So the Anthropo supremacy is a name that highlights the political aesthetic character of Anthropo supremacism. The idea that humans are invidiously superior and that Anthropos claims that a certain kind of human is the only kind of human and everybody else is an animal or uh, part of nature. It's an ideational move of mind, something we do with our thinking. And it's an ideological claim to hegemony, right? Uh, to, to dominate what we understand things to be. And the figure of Anthropos makes this claim on the ontological configuration of the modern world. In other words, it claims to define what the very being of the modern world is. It claims to know and to make and to be the master of modernity and frequently enforces its claims through violent domination. So the Anthropocene is an epoch, but not necessarily a geological one, 
right? Not in contradiction with the findings of damage to the planet inflicted by certain activities of certain humans that are indexed by geoscientists. I think those are pretty legit. But it is characterized by the workings of the invidious hierarchical division between humans and the more than human world, which becomes rendered as less than human. Okay, not just different, but less than human. And that less than human is an aestheticization of this division, this separation. And this division had is, is what accompanied the historical and contingent, meaning it could have been otherwise, and it was otherwise in a lot of places. Constitutive species rupturing alienation of so-called man or anthropos from so-called nature, capital N, because that becomes this thing we produce, of which we humans are actually always a part. So it's based on a big fat lie that asserts itself as truth and got a lot of people to bandwagon on it. So to be clear, I am not claiming that this rupture happened the way geologists say that the Anthropocene emerged. So most geologists are looking for an isochronic, that means like something happening at the same time, homogenous global signal, right? Like CO2 changes that you can find in the strata, in the strata of the rocks. That's fine, but I'm not looking for uh, a single cause or a worldwide moment. I'm not looking for what philosophers call, what Aristotle called the unmoved mover or the first cause of the Anthropocene, okay? I wanna actually say that the Anthropocene emerges in different ways in different places. Instead, I'm trying to understand the underlying logics, the aesthetic political frames and the paradigm of human supremacy, how it's contributed to and rationalized and legitimized the actions, stances, modes of relationality, including colonialism and capitalism, genocide and ecocide that have animated the processes of world breaking that are still happening. I think that whatever the Anthropocene, you know, is, it involves world breaking. And the worlds are more than human, not just human. So I follow Anand Singh's argument that the Anthropocene is patchy, as in ecological patches. It's different in different places, okay? And it's constitutively heterogeneous by nature. It's not gonna have one thing happening everywhere all at the same time, emerging from exactly the same place. Humanity and so-called civilizations emergence did not happen uniformly or emerge from some teleological libretto. And not all humans, particularly many indigenous people, have ever bought into this or participated equally in the making of this condition. In fact, most humans have been harmed by it. To say anthroposupremacism is hegemonic is not to say that it is universally accepted or instantiated universally in the actions of or forms of life of all people. Let's be very clear on that. Instead, what I'm saying is that to reckon with the damage that some humans have done to the biosphere and the rest of the planet, geosphere, atmosphere, lithosphere, cryosphere, all the spheres, right? And also to othered humans via dehumanization, bestialization, animalization, discourses and practices, we must also necessarily reckon with the practical consequences of this toxic ideology. Anthropos then is a virulent aesthetic paradigm of racist, misogynist, speciesist, anthroposupremacist ideology. Anthroposupremacism naturalizes a particular normative modality of being human, right? It seems right to be this way in, in the claims of Anthropos. And this modality of being human takes its power from the false claims to universality that are paradoxically coupled with its invidious hierarchical dualist negations of the value of both non-human beings and humans who have been dehumanized and thus negated. So in this way, anthroposupremacism subtends, supports, and folds like the logic of white supremacism, of patriarchal misogyny, speciesism, and aesthetically rationalize the world-breaking horrors of settler colonial genocide, chattel slavery, systemic racism, capitalist exploitation of cheapened lives and cheapened nature, as Jason Moore puts it, read his books, 
<laughs> through the web of life as alongside aesthetically rationalized destruction of ecosystems, grotesque exploitation of non-human animals, and the reckless use of the planet that is driving biospheric catastrophe and outright ecocide. Though not shared by all people, this hegemonic modality of being human has shaped the modern world pretty decisively. Anthroposupremacism has shaped the dominant Western scientific instrumental rationality. And instrumental rationality, for those of you to, for whom this is a kind of new concept, is the way of thinking that treats everything and everyone as an instrument to be used, something that exists as a means to an end. Okay, and it's very much at the core of how capitalism functions. So it shaped this rationality it has wrought what Hannah Arendt called earth alienation, and it's driven, although she would not agree with me about Anthropos at all, um, and it has driven the development of the modern world through the necropolitical twin processes of genocidal colonialism and ecocidal capitalism, thus giving rise to the existentially perilous conditions for which the term Anthropocene was created. However, let's again be clear on something. Unlike in the geostratigraphic Anthropocene discourse, Anthropocene is neither, or excuse me, Anthropos, is neither a proper cognate for some putative human nature, nor is it an appropriate shorthand for humanity writ large, as that geostratigraphic discourse would have it. Okay, I want to just give a little example, because um, this is everybody's, this is the classic and instantiation of Anthropos tech bro and it's Elon Musk, whose tagline on Twitter is make humanity a multi-planet species. I mean, take talk about inverting everything that we need, right? Um, so he, he is, of course, the CEO of SpaceX, which is going to just hopefully, according to him, is going to colonize Mars and save humanity. And he's the self-described imperator of Mars. Um, I think a little bit of nod to the Imperator uh, Joe Immortan from Mad Max. So he fancies himself to be a pretty badass. And he has this grand vision that he's going to save humanity through his techno fixes. So he is the, an iconic, parod almost parodically apt, iconic instantiation of the figure of Anthropos. And his approach is neither new nor are the, its potentially devastating consequences unknown. He, his attitude, his mode of being, his, his way of thinking of himself as man, the master of nature, the tech bro is going to geoengineer our way out by colonizing another planet. He literally is almost a cartoon version of Anthropos, the figure of Anthropos, which is the titular figure of that concept. But in this way, even though I'm using him as, as an example to try to sort of ground this very abstract, uh, you know, complicated concept in something that I, someone I think we're probably all familiar with. Anthropos should not primarily be conceived of as an individual person or collective actor per se. OK, what do I mean by that? So Elon Musk then should not necessarily be seen as a member of an all powerful fantasy power elite called Anthropos. That's not to say he's not powerful or an elite, even as he instantiates that ethos. But rather, by using him as an example, I want to just highlight the way that he embodies that modality of being human that took on power as the dominant aesthetic paradigm that shaped the emergence of the modern world, making conceivable and sensible and legible, actionable, Rationalizable, rationalizable, palatable for some, and even desirable for some, the actions committed and the activities undertaken by specific humans that resulted in colonialism, capitalism, and ultimately the destabilized conditions and identified as the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene, etc. So getting rid of individual people isn't enough, right? Um, Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson's book, The Ministry for the Future, uh, part of the book premise 
about a climate crisis devastated world is, uh, you know, some a group of people get together and have black ops to assassinate CEOs of big companies to get them to change. Well, it's a nice idea that if we could just get rid of the evil people, everything would be OK. But in highlighting Anthropos as being a core part of our problem, I want to really highlight that it's not about the individual people, even if those individual people like Elon Musk can represent the ethos of Anthropos. We need to get rid of the paradigm, this way of being human. We need to dismantle it. It is an idea, a way to be human, rather than any actual unified entity that purports to represent an actual historically, culturally heterogeneous manifestation of our entire species, Homo sapiens. So with this understanding, I want to argue that Anthropos should be understood not as the flattened universal collective actor that it stands in for, but as a way of thinking and being human that has underwritten the activities and systems and processes. Colonialism, capitalism, genocide, ecocide, chattel slavery, patriarchal misogyny and invidious speciesism that are destabilizing our shared world. With the more than human world. Even more important than establishing this backward looking causal linkage between Anthropos and the toxic conditions of ecological catastrophe and planetary destabilization. More important is how do we establish a way forward? So identifying the modality of the human being, of the being human that is embodied in the figure as a supervenient condition that lends its logic to all kinds of toxic assemblages of world breaking processes and systems and forces that are identified as critical to destabilizing the planet. It's necessary for us to see that to devise effective long term solutions to these problems, we need to remake our systems organizing human activities in the web of life upon different foundations. Different foundations from those installed by Anthropos. In addition to the generous intellectual offerings of indigenous and critical race theorists, who again we can talk about in the um, in the chat, um, I also follow the lead of multi species scholars who are walking the walk of onto epistemologically engaging differently with the more than human world. Multi-species approaches shared by Donna Haraway, Anna Tsing, Deborah Bird Rose, Evan Kirksey, Tom Van Duren, Natasha Myers, and so many others have made a powerful case for decentering Anthropos from the causal narratives of world making and world breaking. So by theorizing Anthropos, I seek to relativize the figure, to put him in his place, to show him showing how his ontological self definition as master of nature and sole agent in a world of malleable mute material is central to the processes that have gotten us in trouble to make it clear that in focusing on anthropos i am not bringing him back to center stage but rather dealing with him so we can decenter him and be done with him something natasha myers wrote offers a much needed context for this investigation. And I'm just going to quote her because it's a beautiful passage. And she's got some wonderful, extremely short pieces that are on the Internet. You can go and read like 10 things to build livable, grow livable worlds. And I really recommend you guys look out for her work um, along with all the other people. So she says we cannot forget to keep asking precisely who is hailed by this Amethropos that figure positioned at the helm of the Anthropocene. Anthrop anthropocenic rhetoric calls out man as the agent of his own demise and simultaneously vaults him into a position as the only viable savior of the planet. Well, enter Elon Musk, right? It is time to stop telling ourselves that if we got ourselves into this mess, we alone can get us out. Which is what a lot of people who argue that we can make a good Anthropocene, for example, if we just, you know, geoengineer and techno fix our way out of the problems. So even as Anthropocene thinking attempts to call our attention to and finally hold us responsible for the egregious effects of our actions, it still figures humans as this singular figure that is transcendent over and separate from some Edenic nature in peril. These narratives recenter rather than decenter man as the agent with natural dominion over the planet's future. So I'm thousands of percent with Natasha Myers here. We engage Anthropos not to 
uh, make him to not to re-enshrine him as the savior, but to decenter him. Okay, so with all the horrific things that are inflicted on some humans through Anthropos, why would we focus on Anthropos supremacy uh, rather than staying with the obvious trouble of white supremacism, for example, that afflicts humans? The answer lies in two places. Now my keyboard's not connecting, sorry guys. I may be using my hand to, to advance each slide. So white supremacism is subtended by the logic and practices of anthropo supremacism. The, the way a leaf is supported by a stem and a stem by its roots. Systemic racism derives its dehumanizing logic from an anthropo supremacism that historically precedes and lends its toxic aesthetic frame and logics to the concept of race. So this foundational, albeit historically situated and not universally experienced, ontological rupture between humans and the natural world, of which we are always necessarily a part, whether we recognize it or not, including Anthropos, is realized through the ascendance of Anthropos. To rectify this wrong and to ultimately survive, we must restore a multi-species balance to the natural world a balance that was disrupted by human activity undertaken in the guise of Anthropos. So healing this wound must start with an overthrow of the Anthropos paradigm and a reconnecting with our existence as a part of the multi-species ecological world and thus understanding why and how Anthropos is the toxic founder figure of the modern world order, whose way of being blocks our way out of the mess is a necessary step towards the remaking of our shared world in a new image a remaking that necessarily includes reckoning with the legacies of anthropo supremacist speciesism, colonial genocide, slavery, racism, class, patriarchy, misogyny, ableism, and capitalism's Ponzi scheme character and its inherent reliance on ceaseless exploitation and how instrumental rationality warps our relationships and our doings. And it is and ultimately has to be a multi species undertaking that we cannot do alone. So if Anthropos negates the animal being of the human, and Anthropos falsely claims to universally represent hum humanness while denying most people's humanity, it is also, it is through the radical erasure and constitutive negation, the negation that makes this new, this, this new other as a being that whose intrinsic value has been erased and that Anthropos emerges from this as the aestheticized pretender to the name of human. So these negations that provide the logics of invidious hierarchical distinctions, divisions and binaries of others, man, animal, man, nature, man, woman, white, black, white, indigenous, white, POC, society, nature, etc. There's many of them that we, we, we all know they, these are used to categorize, separate, and define the self, anthropos, or the white self, for example, and aestheticize the exploitation of all others. To make it seem like it's legitimate, that the world is orga organized and ordered this way, that of course humans have dominion over nature and anything that we think is nature, and we get to decide if we're anthropos. So this move of mind via hierarchical dualisms is a core process of Western master rationality, as eco-philosopher Val Plumwood has established through her scholarship. And again, that's another thing we could talk about a lot more uh, in the chat. This is the same rationality, by the way, that also enshrines the whole subject-object distinction in a homologous fashion, a fashion of the same logic as a master-slave dichotomy. So to cap, Recap, Anthropos is conceived as man as the master of nature, and as such, it's defined against humanity's animal being. The animal is abjected, and its intrinsic value is negated. The animal and all that is deemed nature or deemed animal is instrumentalized, as if it exists only to serve the desires of Anthropos. In fact, Aristotle's Great Chain of Beings explicitly talks about this, says, the lower orders of life, life 
exists to serve the higher orders and guess who's on top. So anything that's regarded as animal or nature then is treated instrumentally as if it exists to serve the desires of Anthropos. By treating them as nature, as Jason Moore and others have richly illustrated the humanity of women, black people, native people, and many others is denied. Even as capitalist value extraction is dependent, denied dependency, Bell Plummet would call it, dependent upon what it steals from those it denies have any value under this invidious ontological hierarchy. So this move, right, of, of gaslighting, of denied dependency that Val Plummet has talked about is so important. Uh, and Jason Moore talks about this in terms of the cheap nature strategy of capitalism. Very worth taking a look at. I also want to make a, a strong call for some must reads of black feminist thought that is offering really important investigations into how to understand the human and how to understand the human in relation to the animal and in relation to our multi-species being and belonging. Sylvia Winter, Zakia Iman Jackson, Alexis Pauline Gums, and others have explored these radicalized dynamics uh, uh, from many perspectives that were often elided in some post-humanist thought and should be considered must read if we care about these questions. So the foundation for this way of thinking with dehumanization as the supreme tool of degradation and devaluation that is necessary to render others aesthetically available for exploitation. That exploitation looks like it's okay, it's right, it's normal, right? Then it is the initial invidious negation of the animal, the natural, the biological, the ecological being in the human that underpins anthroposupremacism. So Anthropos embodies an ideology of radical rupture with all other beings and the natural order of the world itself. So this is not only a conceptual and a pragmatic break, pragmatic meaning in our practices, right? But it is also used to constitutively define Anthropos as such. It's a founding movement, even if there's no individual founding moment, but there are these founding moves of mind that shift the way in which the paradigms function. And this founding movement un unfolds unevenly, disparately and differently, but it unfolds over a number of steps in the history of Western civilization. And there are other ones too. This is not an exclusive list. It's just a couple of places that have been widely noted as being important moments when this shift deepens. These steps include the birth of monotheism, and its culmination in the idea of a supreme deity made in the image of man, right? Who then imagines he is made in the image of God. How conveniently tautological. The great chain of being, which Aristotle wrote about, um, and the idea, right, that, there, that there's a hierarchy of being and everything at the bottom of the hierarchy serves the thing that's above it. Everything below the apex of that hierarchy, which is Anthropos, which is man, just exists to serve the things that are are above it and the idea of the unmoved mover in greek philosophy right that there's some first cause and human anthropos wants to posit his own agency as that first cause of everything really so this paradigm shift also took place during the scientific revolution in a documented brilliantly in a book by carolyn merchant called the death of nature um check it out and she, she tracked the shift from the organicist conception of nature, which is, by the way, very gendered. Guess, guess which gender nature was associated with, to a mechanistic conception that accompanied the rise of enlightenment thought. Descartes, mind and body dualism and other hierarchical dualisms, radical exclusions of certain beings, right, from having any value, for example, denied dependencies, etc. And the origins of Hannah Arendt, what she called earth alienation, in Galileo's discovery and in the invention of the Archimedean point or the God's eye view, right? The, the, the point of supposed true objectivity, uh, a God trick as Haraway calls it, and Cartesian doubt, like, do, can I believe my senses at all? Um, can I, how can I know what, what the world is made of? And, and the rise of instrumental rationality, which emerges from all of these, that finds its fulfillment in neoliberal global capitalism, which tentacularly entangles in and strangles 
us all in the web of life, which is contorted by anthropos machinations. OK, so we've been exploring the ideational underpinnings and performative function played by the emergence of anthropos supremacism and the rise of anthropos in making the modern world, because it will help us get traction on what's been so toxic about this way of being human and how it has profoundly contributed to the planetary state shift that geoscientists have been using the term Anthropocene to describe. So identifying that state shift and periodizing it's important, but that alone cannot explain the how and the why of this radical rupture. OK, so I'm going to move forward a little bit because I want us to look at some artworks, but we've looked at the underpinnings and how the causal relations work. And you know, if Elon Musk really wanted to participate in saving the world, as he says, then perhaps the best thing he could do is use his money to buy up all the critical zones and biodiversity hotspots across the world that are in, in peril, seed them in perpetuity to the local indigenous people who were the traditional stewards for reparations and regeneration. Because while indigenous people don't need to be romanticized as ecologically perfect beings, indigenous societies have lived with the world for a millennia without breaking the world. And while they're only 3% of the world's population, 85% of the world's biodiversity survives in indigenous controlled territories where human relationships with the land are completely different. They're characterized by effective and sustainable land management practices. And guess what? They're not characterized by anthroposupremacism. So perhaps our best hope lies in healing the wounds of our world by reconnecting with humanity's heritage as members of an ecologically entangled world that we rely on to survive, whether we acknowledge it or not. But the likelihood of someone like Elon Musk doing it, using his billions this way is close to null, right? So long as the figure of Anthropos offers him a model of being human that can nurture fantasies of his manly individual greatness through the domination of all other species, right? And other planets by supreme Anthropos, then such a solution is unlikely to resonate because it doesn't give him the chance to cosplay the anthropo supremacist hero. And for, there are so many reasons for this, but one stands out in particular. And it says a lot about why these narratives of Anthropos are still getting in our way, even though a lot of us know that they're bullshit. And it's a good way to end this part of the talk. So for those of you who have uh, studied anything related to post-humanism, multi-species studies, and um, you probably all read Ursula K. Le Guin's now famous carrier bag theory of history um, uh, that draws on anthropologist Elizabeth Fisher's carrier bag theory of evolution to show the figure of Anthropos and how it has dominated the hegemonic imaginaries of human evolution expressed in the story of Ascent of Man the Hero. This essay has become a touchstone for feminist critiques of the Anthropocene. I inherited the essay from uh, Ciclone Olivares, who learned it from Donna Haraway, who was her teacher. Uh, Anna Singh has, had put it in her books and taught it to her students. And this narrative has become part of our collective imaginary tool. And I'm not going to say toolkit, I want to say our carrier bag for carrying new kinds of tools. It offers us a way to de-visualize, in Nick Mirzoff's words, Anthropos to offer a counter hegemonic alter narrative to that of the spear thrusting or rocket shooting, violent, solitary, masculine hero whose killing of great beasts and domination of women and many men who have been dehumanized as part of nature represents nothing less than the fable of the conquest of man over nature itself. And Le Guin notes that the flashy narrative glory of the supposedly solo, self-made great man triumphing over nature through technos or whatever has often obscured the more important life-sustaining world-making collaborations of numerous unvalorized women, men who didn't fit the warrior hunter mold, and a lot of other people and beings ignored in the more famous story. Following Fisher, she describes these people as the unsung heroes, without using the word hero with a capital H, leading human evolution and making history, not by wielding weapons, but by with, with containers and carrier bags into which nourishing substances are collected and carried and brought back to share or store, and how that was vital to niche co-creation and the collective survival of humans. The real origin story of actual humans, as opposed to the idea, the aestheticized idea of humans visualized as Anthropos, has yet to include these vital, less glamorized, collective collaborations 
as the keys to our survival. In spite of what the thrusting hero with his phallic weapon narrative tells us, there are no completely self-made, self-sufficient, or truly solo actors, the way the myth of hero Anthropus tells us. And I quote, it is the story that makes the difference. Uh, she says she's reclaiming her humanity against the grain of the dominant narrative in telling the story. It's a story that hid my humanity from me, she says. The story the mammoth hunters told about the bashing and the thrusting and the raping and the killing about the hero, the killer story. What we need to do, Le Guin suggests, is to start telling ourselves a new story about what it means to be human, which many people can go on with when the old one's finished. The new story, maybe. She argues that to the extent that many of us have allowed our model of civilization to be defined and rationalized and aestheticized, in the terms of the hero Anthropos narrative, we've also accordingly allowed ourselves to become part of the killer story. And so we may get finished along with it. It is not that we, as in all of humanity, are responsible or that we are the virus, as it's become popular to say since the pandemic, but rather that living out the hidden aestheticized script of this old story of Anthropos has endangered life on Earth as we know it. That we that matters is a we that is humbled, vulnerable, dependent on the web of life that feeds us, the plants, the trees, that said energy flowing through the metabolism of the planet, allowing us to live, to breathe. And so as Le Guin urges, perhaps it is time that with a certain feeling of urgency, we seek and create the nature, subject, and words of the other story, the untold one, the life story, that has room in it for the agency and intrinsic value of myriad life forms with whom we share this world. Our more than human, odd kin co-world makers. In this story, as Le Guin reminds us, there is room enough to keep even man or Anthropos where he belongs in his place. And the story still isn't over. The story still isn't over. We need to shatter familiar ways of seeing and offer new imaginaries to help us rethink what it means to be human in this more than human world at a time of unfolding planetary ecological crisis that threatens the stability of life as we know it and endangers us all. We need new aesthetic frames to encode different modes of being human in our more than human world. Art can offer us, it's not the only way, but it's one way, critical reframings and embodied experiences of our intra-actions, to, to borrow a phrase from the feminist philosopher of science and physicist Karen Barad, intra-actions which constitute us with the more than human world. Art can help us to de-visualize, as Mirzov says, the dominant normative aesthetic paradigms that shape what seems natural or normal or right or desirable and decolonize our world-making practices of everyday life and understandings of our relationship to each other and the world. Through vernacular visual cultures in places all over the planet and those practices within situated knowledges of local patchy Anthropocene contexts and lived experiences, art and other aesthetic inter interventions can work to decolonize, devisualize, and resist the necropolitical violence of the Anthropocene. Um, Okuyan Weiser, following Buryad, called it alter modern resistance and said that art can open a space for radical gestures of refusal and disobedience. The power of art. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so what I want to do is just briefly go through a couple of series of works where artists took an active stance to engage with people's understandings of themselves in relation to the natural world and to engage with ecological crisis and offer forms of ecological remediation that help return us to a different kind of relationship. This is Tushar Jog and this is a performance called Riding Rosinante. The Rosinante was, if you recall, the horse that Don Quixote rode on. And it was a 53 day journey by motorcycle from Bombay to Shanghai. Um, riding over the Sardar Sarovar and Three Gorges dams, it was a, an ultra modern ecological performative intervention against the aesthetic paradigms 
of the dominant order. This is part of his journey. I'm just going to go quickly through this. These are the dams, the people he met along the way. And what he did along the way, what the artwork was, was the conversations that he had with the villagers whose lives had been displaced by the dams and whose relationship to the natural world that they lived with in their everyday lives had been radically altered by these mega energy development projects. He sought to learn from them about their embodied knowledges, and he also sought to activate their knowledge of themselves as citizens who make the world. Namjod Altaf is a senior Indian artist who has worked for several decades in Bastar, which is a very uh, fraught, conflict-ridden re region in India where a lot of mining goes on. Okay, and these are iron ore mines in, uh, that she has documented. She has uh, works with local indigenous Adivasis, is the what Indians call indigenous so-called tribal peoples, who are traditional forest dwellers whose worlds have been upturned by mining development projects that are supported by the state and also uh, corrupt local governments and and who have been completely displaced. So she does this two channel video where she brings in the voices of these people who, while uneducated, while not rich with money, understand what they're losing, understand that their existence with the natural world that they, they existed together with is entwined with the survival of that world. So she juxtaposes these really apocalyptic scenes of the mining that with the things that used to be there and the voices of the people, the tribal indigenous people, Adivasis, about their understanding of their predicament and their understanding of the problems that have been brought. Their understanding of being human is a relational understanding of being human as a part of nature. They don't and cannot grasp the understanding of being human that is embodied in the destruction of the world that we actually need to survive, that they see going on all around them. Desire Machine Collective, which is based out of India's Northeast, another region that is very fraught with conflicts. Um, they have done a series of works. Uh, this work is called, in, uh, it's, it's called uh, Inner Lines. OK, and it's also dealing with rivers, in fact. OK, it's a two channel video where they basically look at the intersection of art, technology, ecology and activism. And the work looks at the specter of life ways and knowledges that are threatened by the mega dam and the promises of prosperous hydroelectric powered modernity. Their video travels along the Brahmaputra and its fisheries, its fishermen, its communities. Oh, let me see how to advance that here. OK, so they explore the um, embodied knowledge practices of people who have traditionally lived in a non anthropos way with nature, non anthropo supremacist way with nature uh, of coexisting with the river, who understand uh, that their lives and livelihoods are intertwined with the lives and livelihoods of all the creatures in that environment. Um, so. Uh oh, my power is about to run out. Um, so something's going wrong with my power connection. Excuse me. It seems to have been disconnected. Technology, yay. See, it's not my friend. All right. <laughs> so basically, they're looking at the uneven geographies of the river basin and the changing relationships between nature and society that are brought along with the advance of capitalist modes of being and a lot of post-colonial industrialized development projects. And they look at the way in which the mega dam offers an ideology that treats the human bodies as sources of labor in the body of the earth. This is an example, right, of how certain humans become categorized as part of nature and made available then for extraction. Aesthetically available to be deemed as simply instruments means to the ends that seem to be more important. 
So the Northeast has really been a hotbed of conflicts that are focused on resource extraction, privatization, and enclosure of the water commons. Okay, and you can see these people. Uh, this is one of the, the local river dwellers who have lived her whole life in this riparian relationship. So the building of dams, uh, as the video shows us, don't just displace huge populations and render them vulnerable to flooding, but with the loss of traditional life practices comes a loss of knowledge systems that enabled riverine people to live sustainably and safely with the river for thousands of years. So it's a massive loss. Shibachachi uh, is another artist who has a long-standing ecological practice and it seeks to recuperate old knowledge ways and traditional knowledge ways, but in ways that are not backward looking and retrogressive. Figures of the river also are prominent in her work as well. So in the work Black Waters Will Burn, which was an installation um, as part of the Yamuna Elbe uh, public art project in 2011 in Delhi that I was part of, um, she creates an installation that evokes the inflammable methane rising from the polluted Yamuna River. And she seeks to reclaim both the lost eco-philosophy and cultural memory of related to water ecologies in a, that come from a time and a cultural space that didn't buy into anthroposupremacism. So in this work, we see the figure of what she describes as a bandaged yoni, okay, out on the filthy, toxic, dead Yamuna River. To view the work, which is this bandaged sculpture, right, this yoni-esque sculpture, viewers have to ascend a platform that walks over the sacred texts um, that extol the river as a sensual woman. The Yamuna is worshipped as a river goddess, and yet her body is degraded much in the way that women's bodies are routinely degraded. And Shiva Chachi uh, is interested in that paradox. So the paradox of imbuing bodies of water and of flesh with sacredness within an ideology, but then paradoxically defi defiling them in actual practice is mirrored across gendered and social spaces and ecosystems alike in the Anthropocene or Anthropo-Supremacene, okay? So at night, the floating symbol of the female body bursts into flame. It's a projection. I had a video I would have shown you, but um, anyway, when it bursts into flame, it's pretty spectacular. And it evokes a funeral pyre for the river, made so toxic by men that it can literally burn. In her work, The Water Diviner, it is a site-specific installation in Delhi as well. So our bodies are mainly made of water and we're unable to survive without it. It's another instantiation of our ecological entanglement, right? Our bodies are sites of knowledge, she argues, and the ecological and epistemological entanglement of humans with nature is something that we know with our bodies. Okay, so in The Water Diviner, this is in 2008, she exemplifies this intersection of knowledge, culture, and nature, and the body, embodied knowledge practices. And it's set in the site of a defunct uh, swimming pool that's found in the bowels of the Delhi Public Library. I know, swimming pool, library, what? But actually, that's what it was. And the installation explores social memory of water in a desiccated city. If you've ever been to Delhi, you know what I'm talking about. Any, except for monsoon, it's desiccated, uh, where the underground water simply no longer flows the way that it used to. With the depletion of the water table comes the loss of ways of knowing. Bundles of library books stacked like stalagmites and bathed in aqueous light are interspersed with book-shaped light boxes with miniatures often depicting Krishna narratives of the river culture now lost. And then you see at the end of, the, of this installation, there is a, a looping video of an elephant falling in water, carrying us toward the embodied source of cultural memory. Inside her installation, 
Shiva Chachi asks us all to become water diviners. Ravi Agarwal, who is also a member of my Amar Mundi Multispecies Ecological Worldmaking Lab and a long-term collaborator, has a bunch of, he's an ecological activist and also runs Toxics Link, which is uh, an environmental activist NGO, as well as being a prominent artist. So if we carry the memory of fresh water in our bodies as a form of knowledge, embodied knowledge, right, that's not anthropo-supremacist and doesn't fit in with this paradigm. We've talked about rivers, but how do we know the sea? Ravi Agarwal spent years working with traditional Tamil catamaran fishers and coastal ecologies. This is actually after the ecologies were covering after the tsunami. Um, in a body of work that spans video and photography and installation, sound art, and is grounded in a research practice, he seeks ways of knowing nature and the lived experiences, again, of the people for whom survival is bound up with the survival of the ecosystems on which they subsist. He seeks lessons for how to be human in a more than human world from them because they know more than any of us how deeply this these changes, this state shift called the Anthropocene is affecting everything. Moving between cosmological notions of nature in ancient Sangam Tamil poetry and embodied knowledge practices of the local fishermen who are enmeshed in the larger processes of the Anthropocene, transforming their lives and their livelihoods and the planet's physical systems, Agarwal suggests that there are elements of embodied knowledge and different cosmologies carried forward from antiquity still available for understanding ourselves differently in relation to nature. Even illiterate fishermen understand, probably better than we do, by a long shot, how their lives are being transformed in the Anthropocene. They understand how inextricably the fates of fishermen and fish are of humans and the oceans and how those fates will change together. If we are to save ourselves, we must also save the sea. OK, so that's another artwork of his. That's a long term project he did. And there's actually a bunch of other works I'd love to talk about, but I will uh, actually move on to one last project by Tejal Shah, who offers a sort of different idea. So she's long been preoccupied with biopower, gender, sexuality, uh, the ero power of the erotic and the politics of membership, both in communities and the nation state, in families, and found and born. Tejal Shah has expanded this practice over time uh, into moving further and further into engaging with queer ecologies. So from the constitution of selves and various identities, Tejal Shah's work has examined ways of being human in the spectrum of permutations, right? Showing us the vulnerable, the erotic, the coercive, the celebratory, the violent and compassionate expressions of our nature, whatever that is, questioning all the time, what kind of nature could ours at all be? What does it mean to say we have a nature? How might we live and be otherwise as individuals, as collectivities, and as part of the natural world itself? And this is a multi-channel video installation from Documenta 12, where Tejal uh, engages with this. In between the waves, this is sort of the culmination of that evolution in their practice. Uh, Tejal has looked at alternative communities in a sort of post-apocalyptic world, a world in which people try to thrive even in the ruins. In dresses adorned with cockroaches, they dance on landfills. I don't know if you can see the cockroach on the boots and on the, on the plastic bag dresses they're wearing, but they are embracing all parts of nature, even our cockroaches, as kin. And imagining a society and a culture based on relations of care. And this is a, actually a performance part of the video done in, an, in a mangrove, which is some of you may know is extremely critical kind of ecosystem that functions in many ways also like the lungs of the planet. 
So what if the model of the self that is a member within a larger ecosystem of coexistence, a system in which a hierarchy makes as little sense as a zero sum game or a singular part that gives the whole its substance and yet reaches its fruition through its enactment in and through its relationship to and with the other parts and also the whole. What would that model of the self be like? How, what would the practices of everyday life of that self in the, in the natural world of which we are part actually be like? And how will we make new lives and new ways of being human on the ruins left by the Anthropo-Supremacine. Cajal contemplates these questions, offers us a community of non-binary, gender fluid, or some even post-gender individuals, and new modes of community making and kin making. Okay, I will finish here, because I think we're really, I'm, I'm over time, with a piece about extinction by Ravi, Ravi Agarwal. Okay, so the specter of mass extinction does not take place within a vacuum. And the loss of distinct species is not merely sad because of the death of those creatures, but rather every extinction is immeasurably violent because loss, each and every loss, reverberates across the web of life in ways so interwoven that we can barely begin to understand its implications and consequences until it is far too late. This is Robbie's journal from the project extinct question mark in the shadow of the vulture and extinction memory. So here Ravi takes a multi-species approach to his art making practice and looks at the question of the interaction of our existences with the disappearance of a single species and how that has reverberations far beyond its own life. So after nearly 100 million years of existence, human activity has driven the Indian vulture to functional extinction. Robbie combined journal sketches and notes about cause and effect with archival materials, images of living vultures that were photographed, that he captured because they, we have historical photographs and installed those photographs in public places. The work then connects and highlights how the various processes of the inter of the Anthropocene actually always intersectionally entangle the humans in the more than human world. Vultures once worked as public sanitizers, preventing, for example, an explosion of feral dog and rat populations in the city of Delhi or other cities where they lived. With their disappearance, diseases like anthrax, rabies, and plague have spread exponentially demonstrating that the, this key role that vultures have played in India's urban ecosystems and the multi-species co-niche making that actually always takes place even under, under the nose of an anthropo-supremacist aesthetic paradigm that denies that non-humans can make worlds or that non-humans have agency. So the extinction of the vulture is not only a tragedy for this individual species, but it has huge reverberations all along its trophic relationships and all along the web of life, including humans. Okay, so this is a salt pan, which is part of a coastal salt marsh. And there's a meticulous intelligence to the web of life, which Anthropos as a paradigm refuses to acknowledge, sorry, um, coastal salt pans, which are shown here, are an index of the ecological well-being of the land and the sea. And this image that Ravi took captures the intertwined processes that shape that world and bring us back to the irreducible entanglement of all life. The specter of dying seas, dammed up rivers, displaced people, clear-cut forests, strip-mined wastelands, and so forth, is nothing less than a stand in not only for our own species level mortality, but indeed mortality across the biosphere. The biosphere is comprised of all life on Earth, of which we are but one very small species casting a very large shadow, not as a species, but as Anthropos, casting its very large shadow over all the others. Our biosphere cannot survive without a healthy hydrosphere, lithosphere, 
atmosphere, land, water, air. They're basic necessities for life on the planet, and they are causally mutually entangled. Taken together, the destruction of complex ecosystems such as coral reefs, rising sea levels, the warming, acidification, and plastification of the oceans, jellyfish and algal blooms, disruption of food chain, all down the trophic uh, relations and web of life. They ha have multiple intra-acting, non-linear dynamic feedback loops, right, that, that intra-actionally impact one another and feedback into each other, changing and creating unpredictable weather and patterns and climate changes that spell doom for life on the air, in the ocean, on land, and the human lives that depend on them. Is ecocide not actually a profligate form of suicide? In our shared mortality and mutual material contingency, are we humans and nature not one in the same body and being? And if our activities on this earth destroy that nature on which our lives depend, is not ecocide a profligate form of suicide? We need multidisciplinary practices and collaborations that bring together art and science and philosophy and the social sciences and humanities together to help us rethink the human and our place in the more than human world. This speaker series is offering an, an affording us an opportunity to do this. We have a brief window to make dramatic changes to the dominant systems of everyday life before the Anthropo-Supremacine and the Anthropocene and the Capitalocene and the Plantationocene and the Cthulhuocene become the staging ground for cataclysmic crises that will change all life as we know it irrevocably. So our collective sostalgia or sostalgia as some pronounce it, is a warning bell that we fail to heed at our peril. Only a re radical reimagining of what it means to be human and live a decent dignified life in balance with the more than human world, rather than living parasitically from it, can save us from the destruction unleashed in the Anthropocene. And without new visions of being human and new narratives of how to live in the world, how can we even begin to change how we live or to know what kind of home here on this earth is even worth fighting for or co-making with, becoming with the rest of the more than human world? We need to forge alliances across our disciplines and across species and forge forms of resistance against the Anthropocene. So. We've looked at some art practices that do that, and I want to just end now by leaving us with a thought. I started us with a poem about kindness, and I want to end us with a poem about reimagining our place in the more than human world, reimagining the human condition. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for 100 miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you about mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees and mountains and rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Mary Oliver, thank you so much. How do I get out of the, out of the uh, unshare? Thank you so much. Uh, Maya, this was a brilliant talk. I mean, and and very rich. You could basically have, I think you have enough here for, for two for two talks. I mean, I'm gonna. I have a first question, or or I have a couple of questions, more than a couple of questions. Yeah. Because we can have a conversation after the talk as well, um, because also we have a lot of questions coming up in the chat box, uh, awesome. and. Um, 
So my 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 first question has to do with the sort of the first part of your talk. Let's say that you know your talk has two clear cut parts. One in which you're focusing on the more ideational aspects of this of this uh, ideology that you're calling anthropos uh, anthropo supremacism, right? And in yeah. which you you showcased in a very elegant manner, I would say, a sort of an aesthetic approach to the uh, to the Anthropocene. By aesthetic, of course, you mean, um, you know, you follow the lines of a long line of um, cultural and political philosophers. You approach it as a sort of a classificatory scheme of the beautiful that encodes the order of things. Um, you know, what is right, what is necessary and what is, uh, I suppose, admirable, as you put it, and sexy. Yeah, I mean, Anthropocene has to be right. sexy and you have to invest a lot and make a lot of investments on turning Anthropocene into this right, necessary, admirable and, se and sexy uh, thing. OK, so my my question is that, you know, most of your sort of philosophical references throughout your really wonderful um, outline of this aesthetic paradigm are coming from, um, you know, the Western world, Western civilization, um, so to speak. Uh, and yet you're presenting this aesthetic paradigm as, you know, um, not just some kind of ontology of the modern world uh, writ large. So I suppose my question, if I put it in a sort of very short uh, way, is to say, I mean, whose aesthetic paradigm are you talking about? Are we are you outlining a sort of a Western reading of um, the mythology of the modern world? Or is this anthropos, or rather this anthropos supremacism, um, sort of gone global and has been sort of appropriated in sort of many different ways by, you know, all these different nations that are themselves claiming uh, a place in this big narrative of man as the master of nature? I know it's a big question, but I think it's an important one. It's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so as you know, I have spent most of my life in China and India and Thailand and Russia and other places aside from the West. And so um, I definitely don't want to reify the idea that a Western idea stands for all all people everywhere for all cultures and all traditions. I am explicitly, in fact, arguing against that. But what I want to say is that we have this historically specific particular idea that emerges from, you know, at, at, at different places from a, a trajectory of changes and ideas and that were translated into changes in practices that translated into new kinds of institutions, new kinds of organization, new kinds of modes of being, which are still particular and specific to a historical context. However, through the violence of colonialism and the violence of capitalism, which emerges out of colonialism and is in very, in very many ways the sort of big bang of primitive accumulation, comes from that these initial sort of the mm -hmm. theft of value of women relegated to the domestic sphere like Sylvia Federici talks about when she looks at enclosure and witch hunts in 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 um, in Europe and it, and also obviously from the negated you know the negated humanity and value extracted from the bodies of, of indigenous people who were enslaved, of Africans who were enslaved, of people who were colonized and forced to work for extremely low rates. So this model was is violently pushed through. Does this mean that everybody that has been exposed to the model believes it and is like, hey, I'm anthropos too? No, of course, there's there are is enormous heterogeneity in how people view and understand this paradigm. It is not universally accepted as aesthetically right. However, for the for the, the the historical institutions and historical actors that act under the aegis of this particular way of seeing the world, the monstrous, horrific, murderous, genocidal things that were that were done to create the modern world that we now know do, do come out of this particular moment in Western history, and this mode of doing things is. Push, drive to, uh, push driven across the planet. So whether it's, let's say, China, for example, 
is China capitalist? Um, yeah, I mean, they certainly weren't initially. And China had ecological, massive ecological disruptions that took place in the Qing Dynasty, even deforestation, hydrological projects, and did not have this European trajectory of anthroposupremacism. China has available Taoist ideas of, you know, Tianyuan Hui, you know, the human and nature as one. And even the founding mythos, right, of the founding sort of polity story of Yao and Shun talks about how learn how how political order emerged from learning to channel rivers. Jingzhi has three drops of water in it because it little that literally means like the the proper right administration, the channeling, right, the way one would channel a river by letting it run its course, but then managing it that way. So there's a completely different cosmology in, in India, in China, in many, many places that are now engaged in, you know, whole hog and ecological destruction that come from the adoption of the processes, the systems, the organizational models, the institutional patterns and forms, the modalities of capitalism that then treat the world as material to be used, used and used. And again, you know, Jason Moore has done a really incredible job of laying out how this cheap nature strategy works. So while it's certainly not indigenous to China or, it, or India whatsoever, and the, the history of colonialism in India obviously makes the arrival of these, of capitalist practices, for example, or ideologies of humanism that connect with anthropos completely different, right, from the way in which, let's say, the British related to China with, you know, with their opium wars, China was never colonized in the same way, has chose to adopt certain aspects of Western practice while giving it its own names, whether or not ecological civilization, Shen Tao Wenming, that, that um, you know, uh, Xi that that Xi Jinping is promoting, if it's actually going to be e ecologically uh, sustainable or not, lives uh, remains to be seen. But certainly, different things are going on in different places, and we this this talk does not seek to give a blanket. Uh, like I said, it's not an isochronic signal or a starting moment that happens the same everywhere. But the institutions and the forms and the practices and the processes and the systems that that then turn into extractive relationships to the natural world that are breaking ecological worlds. Those systems are pretty similar um, everywhere now, except okay. in pockets where indigenous people or people who have not been so-called developed are trying to live different kinds of lives. I have a few more <laughs> questions, but I think I'm going to move on to the uh, to the audience's questions because they are piling up. And we don't have much time. Uh, we are going to finish in about nine minutes, I believe. So I have a question from Steve. I think it's, um, I suspect it's Stephen Harrell. I'm not sure. Um, he is uh, saying that uh, brilliant analysis of the ideational story of how we got here. But what, would, what do you say to a farmer or progressive politician or even engineer who is worried about the material trends may or not care about the ideational trends, but at any rate is not going to be the single one of your intellectual heroes. Well, that, the, the, there's a long answer to that and a short one, so I'll give a short one you, first. You're going to have yes. to give a short one, please. I am not, okay. So, in this moment of crisis, we need all kinds of knowledge makers, all kinds of practitioners engaged in various forms of remediating the mess that has been made. I am not an activist or a public educator. That's something I could do or it would be it's a valiant, wonderful, important thing to do, but that is not the job that I have assigned myself. I'm working in the area where I have strengths and I have some kinds of training and expertise to do the work I can do. And that doesn't mean that, number one, people who do activist work cannot engage with the kinds of ideas that I am 
for example, sharing and translate them into the kinds of everyday life terms that, you know, a local farmer would need to have them packaged in, in order to understand. I firmly believe that even people who are completely illiterate, farmers in India, farmers in China, I've met are some, some of the most ecologically astute people I've ever met um, and incredibly intelligent and capable of understanding that there's this way of thinking that's screwed up and is screwing up the world. And they don't have difficulty understanding that. I'm not the person whose job, I can't wear 50 hats, so I wear the hat that I can wear best. And I hope for comrades in solidarity on the road doing the myriad different functions that I'm completely incapable of doing myself. They need to be done. Okay. All hands on deck. Okay, we have another question uh, on a slightly different or completely different uh, topic from Bintar Mupiza. Ah. Uh, apologies for if I pronounced wrongly the name. So thank and, you. Yes, fabulous graduate student. Yeah. Thank you for great and touching presentation, Dr. Maya. My question, in many parts of the world, lack incorporation of participation of ethnic or local communities in mainstream development projects led to conflicts, war, insurgency. For example, here in Asse in Indonesia, the locals refused to live in their, um, in their indigenous lives, but instead want to live in a modern way of living. To what extent your proposed solution could succeed in replacing capitalism and anthropos supremacism? Oh, Bintar has already <laughs> asked great questions in class and brought the big whammy to this discussion. You know, what I don't want to say is that, well, you know, the West kind of, you know, they, they, they got all the good stuff and now the rest of the people who, you know, let's say don't have plumbing or electricity, too bad, you know, you're just going to have to go back and live in a cave. I'm not or advocating that we should all go back and live in caves either, but I will say that capitalism is not going to bring a good life to those people because it relies explicitly on it, the, its denial of dependency on their being rendered cheap, as Jason Moore would call it. In other words, the people who entire used the phrase in a really brilliant paper that he wrote in my class about what he called the undevelopment discourse that that people are in some ways are constrained and kept from certain kinds of development in order to enable the accumulation of others so the solution isn't that we should all be poor together or that we should give up all you know go wandering with our wooden bowls and give up all goods but that we need to collectively reorganize how we live and how we are human in relation to the natural world. We still need to eat, we need the energy, we need sustenance, but there are so many different ways that we could reshuffle that deck and reorganize that configuration so that there was a more, first of all, the environmental racism and massive inequalities that are produced by this kind of capitalism with Anthropos at the helm of it, it isn't gonna resolve. So okay. we need other solutions. We have a couple more questions, actually lots of questions, and I would really like to ask you, Maya, to try to give a short answer to this question. Okay, right. okay we have a question from Levin, I believe it's Levin Ahmed, saying, Hi, yeah. thanks for the brilliant talk. Uh, uh, Zizek argues that only rigorous anthropocentrism based on Hegelian philosophy can save us from ecological disintegration because history can't, re can't be reduced to nature. What is your opinion regarding Zizek's philosophical position? Well, not that I want to diss him. He's a brilliant man in his own way, but I am not sure that Zizek has gotten his hat around the multi-species moment quite yet, and that his mode of engaging is still squarely in an anthropo-supremacist space. So, He's working within a parameters that is in some ways tautologically self-confirming. And it keeps him from being able to do some of the great work that his brilliant mind is capable of doing. Break free, Zizek. <laughs> Gavya Simaitite has several questions here uh, in the chat box. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to talk about all of them. I'm going to ask you this one. You seem adamant the land stewardship and wider environmental practices are handed over to indigenous peoples. 
In the previous talk in this series, Rowan de Souza talked about how this kind of handover would not be any more beneficial as the traditional ways dealt with an Earth environment which no longer exists. So any decision would still be made in the dark. Do you have any additional insights about this? Yeah, OK, so I'm not an expert on indigenous all things indigenous, but I do work closely with a couple uh, indigenous activists. Um, one, uh, Caleb Bain, who is a Jadina Deniza in Treaty 8, British Columbia, is a water activist and anti-fracking activist and indigenous legal scholar who works with the UN DRIP project as well. Uh, he advocates, he has a saying, he says, there's no about us without us. So it's not like I'm advocating that we extract on the one hand, extract indigenous knowledge and keep it and use it and appropriate it. But like, you know, thanks a lot, indigenous people. Now just, you know, we're, we're going to use your knowledge and make the decisions. And I'm also not advocating that or saying that indigenous people would like. The trope is take us back to this to some kind of primitive society. Indigenous people are philosophers have PhDs or scientists or Robin Wall Kimmer, I think is a botanist. I mean, there are myriad indigenous thinkers who are have both embodied knowledge practices from their traditional life ways that they are still in touch with. And also cultural translators able to limb the boundaries of these different worlds. These are not people who are just going to say, no, we just have to go back to some idyllic Edenic past when like before the white man showed up. Nobody's arguing that. They are, are in, in, indigenous people are not advocating, no, you know, uh, remediations that don't involve any technologies or something like that. I mean, that's a simplified idea, I think, of how indigenous people are grappling with the problems. They're advanced intellectuals so just like we are. I'm just saying any solutions to try to understand biodiversity preservation and land management, we'd be stupid to not elicit active involvement of indigenous voices and it's as far as uh you know advisory bodies go those haven't had any they haven't been useful at all right you know so we we need some indigenous people should be given some authority some institutional authority over certain forms of reparation i think that they're the only ones who have the political will and the vision to actually see that through because their priorities are not the same as Anthropos. Maya, we have one last question. Okay. And um, can you answer this question in like two, one to two minutes, please? I thought you were going to um, say words. <laughs> I have to ask this question because first of all, Gabi has been wonderful and has actually written several questions in the chat box. So thank you, Gabi, for that. Anyone can email me as well. Yeah, and she's uh, oh, she's also asking you actually to um, would you be so kind as to post a list of the must reads mentioned and art showcased in this talk? She's also asking for that. But the question that she's asking actually uh, is about the second part of your talk, which was less discussed in this uh, mm. Q session about emerging forms of artwork that are rethinking or unraveling these um, you know, or questioning this uh, ideology of anthroposupremacism. Uh, so Gavi asks, um, how does solar punk relate to the idea of the anthropos and the anthroposupremacism? Would you consider it an acceptable aesthetic stepping stone towards a truly sustainable ideology or perhaps modality of being human as you as you put it yeah solar punk your thoughts on solar punk my my, my first response is read the edited volume that christopher ruprecht who is also a member of my lab who's based out of japan has put together on solar punk he is much much more of a, of a knowledgeable person to speak on solar punk in relation to multi-species sustainability which is what he's known for uh I don't know enough to make a definitive statement, but it sounds pretty cool and I want to learn more about it as a genre uh, in, in fiction, in popular culture more generally, and as a way of rethinking our ways to live. So, you know, I'm all for learning more about it, but but refer to this book. I can I'll get the, the title of the book. It came out, I think, last year on solar punk and 
I think multi-species futures and things. Gabi, we can post the list of must reads in the SciTech Asia Facebook page if you want to check that. Thank you so much. And thank you once again, Maya, for your wonderful contribution to pluralizing the Anthropocene. It was a truly inspiring talk and discussion. We went well over time. Maya has questioned the neutrality of the titular Anthropos in the notion of the Anthropocene. The term Anthropos is not a neutral descriptor of a humanity that bears equal species level responsibility for the unfolding ecological catastrophe. Rather, the term Anthropos exemplifies a universalizing claim to humanity in which a particular genre of the human claims universal supremacy over all other beings. This claim to Anthropos supremacy is backed by powerful forces of political economy, but it's also an aesthetic paradigm, the Anthropos supremacism. And we need to dismantle this aesthetic paradigm to challenge the forces that are truly threatening our species and the myriad of other life forms. We don't have much time, so please help us do that. Please join me in thanking Maya for the pleasure of their company and their wonderful contribution to pluralizing the Anthropocene. Before you all go, let me just remind you that the next, the next session of pluralizing the Anthropocene will take place next Tuesday, November 23rd at 3 p.m. Lisbon time. Next week, I will move to the other side of the stage together with my colleague Jun Zhang from the City University of Hong Kong. And we will be talking about the Anthropocene and the culture of flushing and polluting the, that precious resource called water. The event will be moderated by distinguished biologist Elena Freitas, full professor of biodiversity and ecology at the University of Coimbra. Thank you, Elena. The event is free, but registration is required. So please register at the event's webpage in the Sahab's website. And many thanks once again for your support. See you again next week. Bye. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be part of this conversation. Anybody can email me and contact me on Facebook. We can keep talking. May the conversations continue. I can't wait for your talk, Gonzalo. Bye See you bye. soon. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Go well. <laughs>